Students, it's wonderful to have you here at another exciting installment and our never-ending discussion of our chemical kinetics. I'd like to begin this boring, action-free installment with another exciting chemistry cat from quickmean.com. It says, I'm a cat, not a chemist. Ha ha ha! Ha ha! 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 All right, let's continue by teaching you about reaction half-lives. Reaction's half-life, T sub one-half, is the time required for the reactant's concentration to reach half of its initial value. Now remember that for first order reactions, that I talked about in our earlier lecture, and I'll post a link to right here, the integrated rate law is this. If we replace ln of a sub t with ln of a sub 1 half, and then move some stuff around using the magic of algebra as discussed in page 573 of our text, we can get the following half-life equation. Ooh, man, and believe it or not, if you throw the ln of 1 half into your calculator, it comes out to be 0.693, and then some other gibberish after that. But we'll just round it to 0.693. This equation is very useful and pretty darn simple, frankly. So notice that T sub 1 half for a first order rate law does not depend on the initial concentration of any reactant. That's amazing, isn't it? All right, let's take a look at a problem. The rate constant for a first order process that has a half-life of 225 seconds is what? You're welcome to pause the video here, attempt to do it on your own, and then you can hit play and watch me do it for you. Well, now we move on to a different subject, that of temperature and reaction rate. Now, most reactions speed up with increased temperature. That makes sense, right? I jack up the temperature, the speed of the reaction proceeds a little bit faster. Why is that, though? Well, let's take a look at the rate law equation again. Here's a general rate law equation for a reaction with two reactants A and B. Does changing the temperature change the concentration of A? No, it doesn't. OK, OK. Does changing the temperature change the concentration of B? No, it doesn't. So how in the world does changing the temperature change the rate if, if this A part and this B part stay exactly the same if I change the temperature? What in the world is going on? The answer is because increasing the temperature increases K. So K is the part of a reaction rate that is actually affected by temperature, either up or down. So that begs the question, why does temperature affect K? The answer is explained using something called the collision model, or el modelo de colisión. Let's take a look at that. Molecules have to collide to react. The greater the number of collisions per second, the greater the chance that molecules will get together in a way that actually leads them to react. So it follows then that increasing a reaction's temperature increases individual molecule speeds. This then increases the total number of collisions that they experience and hence the overall likelihood that the molecules will get together in a way that leads them to react. But colliding by itself actually isn't automatically enough to cause a reaction to occur. For example, in a mixture of hydrogen and iodine, the molecules undergo about 10 to the 10th collisions per second, but the reaction still proceeds very slowly. In fact, only one out of every 10 to the 13 collisions actually results in a reaction. Why is that? The reason is because of two additional factors, orientation and activation energy. I'm going to teach you about both of these in sequence right now. The first is orientation. Foremost, in order to react, reactants have to collide with the proper three-dimensional orientation space, as the following cute little picture pictorially depicts. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. What the heck is a peck, anyway? Well, that was really stupid, Peck. Don't call me a peck. Oh, I'm sorry. Peck, 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 peck. You be careful. I am a powerful sorcerer. See this acorn? I'll throw it at you and turn you to stone. Ooh. I'm really scared. No, don't. Don't. There's a, a peck here with an acorn pointed at me. I wouldn't want to waste it. Ha! Peck, 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 peck. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, here's the point. You can imagine a molecule of uh, chloride, shown here in green, interacting with NOCl or NOCl right here. If the chloride impacts the NOCl at just the right position, that is the right three-dimensional orientation, 
Then the two chlorine molecules interact and walk away as Cl2, the product, leaving behind nitrogen oxide. If, however, the chloride impacts with the incorrect three-dimensional orientation, impacting, for example, on the oxygen atom, then no reaction occurs. You can reason, then, that even if the number of collisions is very high, that doesn't automatically lead to a reaction occurring. You have to not only have the collisions and impacts be high, but you also have to have them be with the correct three-dimensional orientation. But there's one more factor to consider. Beyond molecules needing to collide with the correct orientation in order to react, there's another more important factor that affects reaction rate, activation energy. You see, chemical reactions always, always require a certain amount of energy to get started. In other words, there's an energy barrier keeping reactants from becoming products. You can imagine that shown here. If, for example, I was looking at the reaction of this ball rolling down this hill, in order to get that reaction to actually proceed, I have to, first of all, roll the ball up the hill. That requires an energy investment or an energy cost. This activation barrier, this energy investment or energy cost, is called its activation energy, or E sub A. It is, in essence, the amount of energy required to get reactants to convert into products. OK, this might sound weird, but it's actually true. There are actually some reactions that are quite exothermic, that is quite energetically favorable, but still don't happen easily because they happen to have huge activation energies. That is, energies between the reactants and products that are very, very high. For instance, in this reaction, where I'm converting molecule A into molecule B, the product B is much, much more stable than the reactant. In other words, this is an energetically favorable reaction to go. And this reaction is quite exothermic. However, this reaction does not occur spontaneously. Why? The reason is because in order to convert A into B, the reaction has to traverse a re very relatively unstable high energy state that I call C. This is called a transition state. In other words, in order to get from A to B, you have to go through C. And C is very, very high in energy. The energy required to get up to C, this transition state, is called the activation energy. The figure shown here to the right is called an energy diagram. Once again, even though product B is more stable than reactant A in this reaction, which means that it's an exothermic and energetically favorable reaction, the reactant still has to traverse this high activation energy hill in order to get rolling down to the product. And why is the activation energy so high for this reaction? The reason is because transition state C is quite unstable. And A has to go through C in order to get the ball rolling down to product B. So to get this reaction to even go, I have to invest or pump into the system the energy difference between this line and the top of the hill. I, of course, will eventually get back all of that energy and more as this exothermic reaction starts going and the ball starts figuratively rolling down the hill to form product B. I now want to show you two different generic energy diagrams. The first is this, where reactants are at a lower energy than products. This is an endothermic reaction, once again, because products are at a higher delta H level than reactants. This one, in contrast, is an exothermic reaction, because products are at a lower overall level than the reactants. The height of the hill that separates the reactants from the peak is its activation energy. Please memorize what these charts look like, because I will totally give you charts that look like this and ask you to pick out which one is an exothermic and which one's an endothermic reaction. Got it? Good. Now I'm going to complicate it up a little bit. You see, some reactions traverse multiple transition states and form transient products en route to their final products. The transient products made along the way are called intermediates. As we can see in this diagram, I start with my reactants. I've got my products at a much higher energy level, which means this is an endothermic reaction. I go up the hill to the peak where the high energy transition state exists, and then I can go down into a valley. The valley is called an intermediate. This intermediate can sometimes be actually isolated and analyzed in some reactions. The intermediate can then go up to a second transition state before going finally down to the product. Why do I care about this? It's because I want you to know the vocabulary. Please remember that at the top of the peaks, those are transition states, while these little valleys in between are called intermediates. I'm now going to introduce you to something else called the Arrhenius equation. 
Now, like everything else in chemistry, there exists an equation we can use to calculate activation energy, or E sub A. It's called the Arrhenius equation, and looks like this. In this equation, K is the rate constant. R is the ideal gas constant. And for this particular equation, you have to use this specific ideal gas constant, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. T is the reaction temperature, E sub A is the activation energy, and A is something called the frequency factor. Now, as I mentioned earlier in this video, or the previous one, I honestly can't remember, if you change the temperature of a reaction, you change the reaction constant K. By manipulating the Arrhenius equation that I just showed you, in some ways discussed in our text, we can calculate what the new K value will be if we change the temperature by using this equation. Now, I realize that this equation might make you soil yourselves, figuratively speaking. Hopefully not literally speaking, because no one wants to clean up the mess. But this equation is actually derived from the Arrhenius equation I just showed you. And yes, for my students, I will give you this equation on the exam where you need it. This equation is beautiful because it allows you, if you have a rate constant at one temperature and a rate constant at another temperature, to determine what the activation energy or what the respective temperatures are. Let's see if we can actually apply this to a problem. A certain first order reaction has a rate constant of that at 20 degrees Celsius. What's the new rate constant at 60 degrees Celsius if its activation energy is 75.5 kJs per mole? I'm not going to solve this for you here, but I'll post a link to a separate video in which I do, which you're welcome to watch if you wish. That, then, is the end of this lecture. I hope it's been more fun for you than it has for me, because, wow, I'm tired of recording videos. I need to go take a nap. Rest your mind, rest your body, rest your soul. And overall, and of course, please have a good and happy rest of your day.